Hello, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on wherever you are in the world. And you're very welcome to this webinar about the world of blended Scotch whiskey. My name is Charlie McCarthy. I work for the Wine and Spirit Education Trust as a business development manager in the field of spirits. And my job is essentially to help spread knowledge and uh, my passion about spirits uh, across the network of WACT educators and students and potential students globally. I'm very lucky to be joined today by a field of people who are, I safe to say, much more expert in the world of blended scotch than I myself am. Uh, we have Craig Wallace from Diageo, who's a master blender at Diageo. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking to him about what he does. Hello, Craig, and thanks for joining us. Right. And we also have Christiana Sherry, who is a very knowledgeable whiskey writer and educator. And uh, I had the pleasure of doing my WCT level three course uh, on spirits with Christiana about three years ago now. Thanks for joining us, Christiana. Thanks so much for having me. And if you haven't done your level three yet, go for it. It's amazing. Oh, we like that. Get a, a solid plug in early. Thank you. And we're also uh, at, I suppose, the opposite end of the scale from the Diageo um, experience of blending. We've got a very new and uh, boutique uh, blending studio called Woven Whiskey uh, based in Leith. And uh, we're joined by Duncan McRae and Pete Allison from Woven Whiskey. Thank you guys for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, absolute pleasure. So um, we have got an hour and that's actually a relatively short time to cover everything we want to cover. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go through a very quick summary of the production methods and the terms and phrases used around Scotch whiskey and how that uh, refers to blended whiskey. And then we're going to dive into a bit of a deep dive with uh, Craig is master blender at Diageo talking about his practice in blending uh, whiskey for Diageo, which is, as everybody I'm sure will already know, probably the, the major player in the Scotch whiskey world. So at WSCT, we always talk about four stages of production. We always start with a raw material. The first step is to process that raw material in order to create a sugary liquid. Once you have a sugary liquid, you introduce yeast and you will ferment in order to create ethanol and congeners. And then you will distill through heat to select and concentrate ethanol and desirable characteristics. And after distillation, you will either age and cast or adjust otherwise the color, the aroma and sweetness, uh, the texture and alcoholic strength. When it comes specifically to Scotch whiskey, those stages break down into the first stage, which is uh, processing the grains, uh, because the grains contain starch and the starch needs to, be, needs to be converted into sugars. And then you will ferment using almost exclusively cultured yeast, but there is some possibility to use ambient yeast, so we may talk about that later. And then we get into the third stage, which is distillation. And in Scotland, both pot stills and column stills are permitted and we look at how they are used in different manners that they're used as well as we go through. And then after distillation, as already mentioned, the spirit can be oak aged, it can be blended. It's always dry. That means that there's no sugar added after distillation. And as no sugar comes across distillation, this means that it doesn't contain sugar, even though it might have lovely sweet vanilla, coconut, caramel aromas. Uh, speaking of caramel, Spirit caramel color may be used to standardize and regulate the color, but this, this doesn't bring any flavor. It's just a colorant. And typically it'll be diluted down from your uh, cast strength down to a bottling strength. So one of the most important stages specifically when it comes to scotch is malting barley. And this is essentially a way of tricking the barley into thinking that it's going to germinate in order to convert the starch into fermentable sugars. And the important thing that we want to talk about is the flavor that that creates at the end. Now, depending on whether you halt that process by introducing neutral hot air, that would create a lovely cereal, toasty, malty, porridgey type of aroma. Or optionally, you could also use peat smoke. And this peat smoke introduces this kind of smoky, peaty aroma that a lot of Scotch aficionados are very familiar with. And it's a very tenacious set of compounds called phenols and some carbonics there as well. And they will remain with the spirit right through to the end, but they may adjust and uh, sometimes diminish through aging. So we got, we got our malted barley, we grind it up to create a grist. We introduce that grist into some hot water and that creates a, a liquid called a wort. And then that wort will be fermented by the introduction of yeasts. And then depending on what type of grain you've used initially, you're gonna get two separate styles of liquid. 
The first style of liquid is if you use exclusively malted barley in that wash. That can be put through a pot still. It's typically put through twice. In fact, that's the minimum. Sometimes it can be put through more often than that. Sometimes it'll be twice, uh, three times. If you go into a cask, uh, and this will be an oak cask in Scotland for a minimum of three years. And at the end of that, you have malt whiskey. And that can then be bottled as malt whiskey. And if it's from a single distillery, that will be single malt. Alternatively, it'll be a mixed grain wash. And that will go into typically column stills. And then that will produce what's known as a grain spirit, which will be aged for three years minimum to produce single grain whiskey. But Single grain whiskey isn't very common. And even though everybody thinks of single malt whiskey, in fact, there's not a lot of the pot still spirit that's produced in Scotland ends up in single malt. The vast majority of both of these are combined and they'll be the products typically of many different distilleries. And that is how you get blended Scotch whiskey. You're blending your malt whiskey with your grain whiskey. So that is quite a crash course in Scotch whiskey. And I suppose now it's time to bring in uh, somebody who has far more experience than I do of actually making whiskey. And that would be uh, Craig Wallace. Craig Wallace is a master blender from the Agio. And Craig, um, I suppose as an interesting starter question for people is, what does a master blender do? What is your job? What does it entail? Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that was a really interesting intro. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, so in terms of day to day for Master Blender, it's uh, it's almost end to end from the raw materials all the way through to the bottle. So um, I get involved very heavily with our distilleries to make sure that the flavours they're making on a batch by batch basis are really consistent. Um, we want consistency, we want intensity, we want diversity of flavour from our distilleries. So a really big part of my role was to work closely with our uh, almost 30 distilleries uh, to make sure that every batch is is is, is giving me that. Um, and obviously that's coming from the raw materials, the the, the yeasts, you know, the the, the grains, etc. So yeah, part of my role was to work work with the the technical teams we have in our our distilleries and our our central lab up in Elgin to make sure all that is is running smoothly. Um, also work very closely with our guys in warehousing and coopering. To mm -hmm. ensure that the cask quality is consistent um, going forward, so we look a lot at the suppliers of casks, etc., and and do a lot of sampling and uh, both sensory and chemical analysis on those casks to ensure that quality is consistent going forward. So, um, so, as I say, looking at that quality both at the new make stage and through the casks, we can be pretty confident when we come to blend it in however many years it is, whether it's three, five, twelve years time. We can be confident if we get it right at the start that we're going to get a good result at the end. So, uh, so yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, that quality is really important to my role. Yeah, innovation some, as well. I, sorry, on you go, Charlie. Sorry, no, I was just saying it's something that's I think is very interesting for a lot of people when they discover this is that in an operation like the Agio or in any large uh, distillery that it's actually the blender who's giving that instruction to all the other practitioners in terms of the recipe and the outcomes that they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, it's a real team effort. So uh, it's about having sort of, you know, the, the the good relationships across the different parts of the, the company. Like you say, it's a big company. So those relationships are really important. We have really strong technical expertise in our malt distilling, grain distilling and, and coopering areas. So yeah, as the blender, I'm just really there as the almost middleman to make sure that um, I'm happy that everything's happening as I would expect it to. But you know, using the people's knowledge in those areas to actually deliver the consistency that I'm, I'm looking for. Yeah, I've, I've heard people describe the role similar to that of a, a, an orchestra conductor. I don't know if, it's that, if that's something you might agree with, agree with or not. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that. Yeah, that's one that a lot of people talk about. Yeah, so I mean, like I said at the start, I think we've, so we've got 30 distilleries now, soon to be 31 um, when we reopen uh, Port Ellen. And having all those different flavours, you know, that's 30 flavours if you think about it, but then all the different cast types as well. So sort of four kind of standard cast types, but then other other innovative casks as well, then multiplies up those flavor options that I have. So it is really just the more flavor options, the better uh, in some ways for me, gives me more flexibility and, and uh, um, possibilities when it comes to innovation. Uh, and then obviously for ongoing products is about the consistency of these flavors. 
Yeah, I, I, I suppose consistency is, is, a, is a really important thing. I, people think of consistency largely in relation to single malt whiskey, because obviously there's a house style that has to be reproduced year on year on year. Um, traditionally, the role of the blender, they might have been buying in casks or buying in new make or sourcing new make from outside distilleries and uh, trying to create consistency with a very inconsistent set of products is that something that you've seen change since you started as a distiller yourself or has that always been a kind of that reciprocal trade in the background where distilleries are swapping casts and swapping new makes and trading in the background yeah it's still a really important part of the, the work i do as well so i work very closely with our kind of sales team to make sure that we're buying in the whiskies we need so uh, some of our products for example jnb still talks about 42 different uh, whiskies in that blend. So you know, as I said, we've, we've got 30. So we buy in a number of different grain whiskies and malt whiskies to combine and give us that complexity in our, our product. Um, and also sometimes it, it just allows us to actually add to the consistency. So um, if a distillery may be closed for a couple of years, we may be buying some whiskies to substitute in that, that flavor style in our, in our recipes. So it's a kind of mutual thing. So we provide different whiskies for other people in the whiskey industry and we and then we then we get an exchange usually it's an exchange you know a swap of okay. so much malt whiskey for so much grain whiskey or or whatever it may be uh, so it's almost like a kind of horse trading barter type of thing rather than cash it can be cash but it's something quite often it's, it's swaps yeah it swaps really okay that's really interesting and um when i suppose something that people a lot of people don't realize is that single malt whiskey doesn't mean it's one barrel it's always large batches and it's always it's always a matter of blending whether it's a single malt a single grain or a blended scotch um for something that i always appreciate about blended scotch and i think it can suffer sometimes as being seen as a poor relation of single malt whiskey even though it's by far the uh larger output from the industry i think it's it, the, the number that always gets banded about is 90 percent of the whiskey that comes out of Scotland is is yeah. blended Scotch whiskey. Um, I think it might be interesting for people to hear about the the different levels of complexity that you can achieve in a blended Scotch whiskey that it won't be as easy to achieve in a single malt potentially. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like you say, a single malt from one distillery tends to be one flavor style, and then you can use the cask type to to sort of push that in different directions, which is great. It allows us to produce some fantastic single malts, but for blending, you've got that complexity across multiple different distilleries. And you know, you might have uh, a distillery such as, let's say, Linkwood producing a kind of apple uh, fruity flavor, whereas a distillery such as Mortlick, traditionally sort of meaty, rich, and then obviously our famous Isla distilleries as well. So, you know, uh, and 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 places like Talisker up in, in Sky. So. That, that breadth of flavour is really important to me as a blender. And when you're working on, on products, it's about layering those flavours on top of each other. And sometimes it's really interesting how those come together. It's sometimes a bit unexpected. And mm -hmm. you you um, quite often have to do quite a lot of um, modifications in the lab just to get that balance correct. So you might, you might feel like you want a really fresh, fruity blend that you're innovating on, but in reality, you have to actually add some of the more complex malts in there as well, potentially some even some smoke just underneath that um, to, to sort of pull the whole blend together and give it more complexity and depth. Even though you thought to begin with, it's a very straightforward project, but actually, you know, bringing more more things in is actually what you need. And it just yeah. it's just through sort of experience, you know, knowing knowing the characters you have at your disposal, the flavors you have at your disposal, and also lots of trial and error in the lab. Um, blending and and having you know having fun really it's, it's one of the parts of the job i love the most is the is the, the experimentation in the lab and just having a bit of fun to create different things and, and and where does the balance sit for you in terms of the process between nosing uh a spirit tasting a spirit doing organoleptic analysis or doing chemical analysis how how is the balance achieved there yeah i mean uh so it's, it's almost all uh in terms of uh balance towards nosing and um, we only taste um, at very almost the last minute if we're innovating you know we would nose hundreds of samples narrows down to the flavor styles we want potentially bulk some samples together to create larger bulks and and flavor components for the final blend and then we, once we blend those all together we would, we would then do some more some 
more detailed tastings and those things. So it's, uh, I'd say, majority in those. Uh, and then when we get to the final stages, it's tasting. And we actually do it, I'm not sure if people are aware, we do it at different strengths as well. So we start off usually at 23% ABV because we feel mm -hmm. like we can pick out different flavours more easily at, the, at that strength. And obviously then we know that the consumer is going to try it at um, sort of 40 plus, yeah. obviously. Um, so obviously the final decisions are always made at 40%. Um, and then you mentioned analysis, that's really important. It's always been around, but I feel like there's been lots of uh, advances in analysis in the last few years. And, and I find myself uh, leaning on the, the scientific experts and our team more and more to give me uh, even more confidence based on their scientific uh, findings in the lab, which is, you know, it's, it's amazing what they can do these days to find out what the, the all the different compounds in, in the whiskey is absolutely fascinating. So um, yeah, that's a, a huge part of it as well. But the nose is still the, the most critical part, I think. Yeah, I'd say, I, I, it fascinates me that even in this day of such advanced technology that it really does still come down to the nose. Um, one last thing I wanted to touch on before we move on to our, our next panelist is um, obviously you work on a number of different blends for Diageo. The, the flagship blend that almost everybody in the world will be familiar with is Johnny Walker, but we also have Buchanan's, we've got Black and White, we've got Old Par, and they seem to have different profiles, but also they seem to appeal to different countries, different areas in the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I've over my 25 years, I've kind of worked on almost every Diageo blend now. And you're right, there's there's different styles. Um, it's probably fair to say that the Diageo style is sort of rich, complex, smoky. Um, uh, and but there's variations within that. You know, like uh, Johnny Walker uh, Black, 12 year old, is, is is a really smoky blend, whereas Old Par is a bit more subtle with smoke in there. But very important to have that that smoke in there in both of them and just it brings different things out of the the liquids but we do notice that in certain geographies so i noticed on the on the on the participants there there was some people coming in from latin america etc and yeah. you know blends like buchanan's and old bar are absolutely massive in latin america and now in north america as well getting big and and i think um the flavor style of uh, you know particularly uh buchanan's lends itself to that smokier style and then Old Par is a bit more accessible and it works really well in, with mixers and things like that as well. So we've noticed that that works very well in uh, parts of uh, South America where they like to mix it with things like uh, coconut milk and things like that to create a really fantastic um, uh, cocktail. So yeah, these different flavours have just kind of uh, seemed to work in different areas over the years and it's evolved through time and, and become part of the almost culture in some of these countries. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, especially the way that people mix uh, blended scotch in particular, I think opened out the whole realm of mixability into the category of whiskey. Um, Craig, thank you very much for that. I'm going to move Great. on uh, for a moment uh, to uh, Christiana Sherry, and we'll come back to Craig at the end. We've got some uh, follow up questions. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people in the chat joining us from all parts of the world. That's amazing. If you have a question uh, that you'd like to uh, post to us for the Q&A, that's going to happen at the end. Uh, please do log that there in, in the Q&A section. And um, if you're interested in doing a WSET qualification, um, just to give everybody a little bit of um, uh, knowledge about WSET with the leading provider of spirits, wine and sake qualifications around the world. And uh, we have got a network globally of over 800 course providers available in 15 different languages. Obviously, we're well known throughout the world as uh, the leading provider of wine qualifications, but increasingly the spirits qualifications at level one, level two and level three are getting uh, a huge amount of renown, thankfully throughout the world. And if you do want to find a local provider, just go to wsetglobal.com. And there is a page there called Where to Study, and you'll be able to find a local provider. So with that said, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome on Christiana Sherry. Christiana uh, and I did the level three course together years ago, and I can safely say that Christiana has got one of the best palates of anybody I have ever met, having listened to some of her tasting notes. She's got this amazing level of, of analytical clarity in how she tastes, and it's very impressive. She's a, a well-known writer and uh, educator, especially in the world of whiskey. Uh, Christiana, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction. Very kind. Well, you know, every word of it's true. <laughs> Charlie knows his stuff and is fabulous and an amazing host for us today. Ah, thank you so much. Um, so, Christelle, I suppose what I wanted to cover a couple of topics with you, the first of which is the category kind of obviously when column distillation and uh, continuously distilled spirit became available, then it became blended and became what we know as blended scotch today. But it seems to have gone through a few trials and tribulations as a, as a category, gone from infamy to fame and then maybe some mixed perceptions throughout its, its long history. Uh, I wonder if you have any kind of big impressions that you want to share with us from that journey. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think blended scotch has some of the richest stories and such a, you know, sort of a decadent history. I don't know why no one has made a movie of it yet. And I think if we go back to the advent of the coffee still back in the early 1800s, which was the name for the sort of early stage of development for the stills that you can see on the screen, where you can just distill plate after plate after plate, get your spirit done, no batches needed, boom, out the door. And that really was the start of all things blended scotch and then also later on which was a very bad thing for cognac um but something that really propelled blended scotch in particular to sort of the global fanfare was the phylloxera crisis and there being no brandies available and then scotch stepped into the fore was like we're here you can taste us and then it rose to global renown obviously with blended scotch being the predominant category like fast 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 even more than today um single malts just weren't really a thing back then obviously things like prohibition really harmed it um We've had rise and falls of whiskey in general, whiskey locks, too much whiskey, overproduction, distilleries closing. Most recently in perhaps the 1980s, we saw some of the big names sort of close and never open again in terms of um, grain production and single malt production. But then I really think what's incredibly exciting is if we look back even before that sort of the glamour era of blended scotch in movies and films how it was really celebrated that really went away it's come back again now and I think from the late 2010s onwards we've seen scotch whiskey go global again this isn't the first time it's happened this isn't the first time everyone's got really excited about it I think the difference now is that for some reason we're all incredibly excited about single malt as we should be it's delicious but let's not forget this incredible category that we have today it still accounts for around 90%, some might say less, some might say 85% now, but you know, we cherish it, it's wonderful. There's incredible breadth of flavor, incredible dynamism in there, and it has ebbed and flowed, it's flowing right now, long may it continue. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things that always strikes me about um, blended scotch in that historical aspect is obviously it's brought us so many things like the, the scotch and soda, which is, you know, ubiquitous globally now, really only came about because of blended scotch, because it was uh, available widely. When, uh, from an Irish point of view, I think uh, the, obviously the Irish whiskey industry had a huge crisis after prohibition. Uh, I think one of the things that the Scots managed to do quite cleverly was their exports to Canada and Mexico and Cuba and Costa Rica really boomed during prohibition. Now, obviously, all that whiskey wasn't really going to be ultimately consumed in those countries. A lot of it was finding its way by bootleggers into the States. But um, you have to take your hats off because uh, there's one thing you'll always say about uh, Scots is that they're canny businessmen and women and they know how to maintain an export strategy and a route to their customer. So it was very impressive. Absolutely. And I find it wildly entertaining that you could get a prescription for Scotch whiskey at that time. <laughs> yeah, I need yeah. my Scotch. It's not because I want to party. It's not because I want to sit with my friends. <laughs> believe it believe it or not you could when i was a child get a prescription for for guinness true story that is incredible i love that yeah, so much. yeah. Love uh, <laughs> that's probably another story for another time um uh, one of the things i did want to cover with you as well because um we have got kind of that shared background is obviously we there are perceptions of scotch and i think one of the things that I enjoy about WACP course is that it gives you the knowledge to be able to dig under a label and to have confidence in your tasting skills so that, you know, when you read a label, you're going to know, oh, this word blended means this, this word scotch means this. Um, the words Highland and um, Speyside and all this, the regional variations in scotch, I think they probably stylistically used to mean more than they mean now. Would you agree? I would completely agree because, I mean... On Isla, you can get unpeated um, spirit. In Speyside, you can get smoky peated spirit. I don't think it means that much at all. I do have three very quick examples to do a quick run through okay. um, for things that you can see on the label. I've got um, 
a Johnny Walker right here. I don't think you can see it's got a little bit dark. I forgot about the time of day, the sun setting in Brighton. Um, obviously, the main thing to look out for is blended scotch. I also want to show this off just because it kind of um, maybe goes against that narrative that blended scotch is boring. A lot of the big brands these days release special releases. They'll um, hone in on certain flavors. So don't forget about that. But yeah, if you, if you see blended scotch on there, that's what you're looking for. Um, obviously, age statements run across all scotch, but it's always worth pointing out that blended whiskey is not just this cheap. It doesn't have to just be, you know, the three year minimum. There's all kinds of age statements out there. This one's 12 years old. You can see it there from Chivas. And, you know, age doesn't always mean better at all. We know that. But I think it is interesting just to flag that this is a thing. And it's it's a useful thing, I think, sometimes when you're trying to navigate blended scotch and get rid of these preconceptions. And then I wanted to show a Berry Brothers one as well. But something that doesn't actually mean anything in terms of whiskey labeling. So it's got its age statement there. I think you can see it's 21 years old. It's also got small batch on it. And oh. this is across all whiskey. But I saw this on my shelf earlier and I thought, I'm going to use this moment to shout it out. That doesn't legally mean anything. So there's lots on the label that will help you navigate something, whether you think it might be, you know, better quality or it's got an age statement or it tells you the grains within it, perhaps. Um, but small batch doesn't really mean anything. So I just wanted to show Amazing. That. Amazing. It's really, it's really important to know. And as well, I think one of the topics we're going to touch on later when we talk to Duncan and Pete is the idea that with that minimum age statement, if you've got lots of different component whiskies, the youngest will be that age at least, and you'll have some older whiskies in there. But also sometimes it's not the old malts you want, it's the old grain whiskey that can be actually oh a sought after commodity. Um, and, and that could be quite interesting. So I'm um, going to hop over actually to Duncan and uh, to Pete now, if that's okay, Christiana, and then we're going to come back. Uh, something I'm going to ask all of the speakers to think of, I won't put you on the spot straight away, but what's your favorite blended scotch? If you want to, you know, promote your own product, that's absolutely fine. I'm not going to say, nay say that at all, but maybe not, not going to be the first question. So uh, we got Pete joining from uh, Leith and we got Duncan joining all the way from uh, Adelaide. So thank you very much for joining us, guys. Welcome. Hi, thanks, Charlie. It's great. To, uh, it's, uh, it's a great turnout as well. Fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the great questions coming through as well on the Q&A. We're going to have a little bit of time towards the end to, to cover all of those off. So I, I suppose what's interesting to talk about uh, in terms of your guys journey is you both got a wealth of experience be that working on McAllen or Grants or you both work for Master of Malt and the Atom Brands uh, whiskies which uh, for people who don't know would involve that boutique company and various different brands there um, and I suppose what I'm interested to hearing from you guys is how traveling around the world and representing whiskey or gin as it might be um, uh, how that has informed your de decision and your journey to to set up a new boutique whiskey blending studio. Dunk, do you I want think, to do that one? Yeah, even before that, you know, we we actually all met in in the bars of Edinburgh and Scotland, going back nearly twenty years. I'm sad to say now, um, but I think what what it did and actually the level of education that was being given to bartenders at the sort of genesis of the cocktail revolution that we're sort of currently in um it really opened our minds to technique and flavor and almost you go on this bell curve journey where you start learning and then you realize that there's so much more to learn you know that you could never possibly know yeah. anything and, and it's best to keep an open mind and try everything and interrogate everything and um uh, you know, courses like the WSET uh, in, in spirits, you know, it teaches you, as Carrie Anders did, to, to look beyond the label and really interrogate things and ask why. And, you know, it sets you up for, I think, a, a life where you look at any liquid differently because you can sit there in a blind tasting and using the, the knowledge that you get sort of hone in that it might be this price point or this style or this category. And I think that's remarkable. It's a remarkable skill to have. But for us, what it meant was that we, you know, we'd always seen exceptions to the rules or exceptions to the accepted wisdom when it came to flavor and, and creation of flavor. So when we decided to, to do what we're doing now and, and start a small boutique, you know, whiskey blending operation, um, we knew that it wasn't going to be as simple as A plus B equals C, that we were going to have to find, 
you know, combinations. You know, we don't own any distilleries. We don't have infinite whiskey at our disposal. We had to seek out, you know, as as good a whiskey as we could get um, through indie bottler markets or or brokerages and create blends that befitted a vision of of what we felt blended whiskey could be. Um, but it was a very different process to what we were taught you know blending looked like because we we were essentially um you know making it up at a very small scale as as amateurs but we had a very high standard we wanted to achieve but we had to be very creative with the combinations and the accepted wisdom of uh of of what um people i think are uh, assume is is the process for making a blend we we almost deconstructed it and started again um but but that's more more Pete's wheelhouse than mine, so I'll let him come in on that. Yeah, I, I suppose Pete, you're 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 the guy who's at, at uh, the cold face is probably too crude a word for it, but but you're you're the guy in with all the bottles and all the samples and doing the mixing and creating the recipes. Um, operationally, I mean, we can see some fantastic schematics and bottles behind you. Operationally, how how does your how does your day go or your week go? Yeah, I, so yeah, I mean, I'm right now in our uh, tiny little lab just uh, in the center of Leith, which was the old historic center for blending whiskey. Um, and I think really what what the big difference between us and, uh, and the likes of Diageo is that we're much closer to, I suppose, how blended whiskey began sort of in the greengrocers and at a very small level where buying tiny parcels of uh, of single malts and grain whiskies and putting them together into unique compositions that um, that are perhaps a bit more complex or challenging or um, or maybe just slightly different from uh, your blend of whiskies that you perhaps see on the on the shelves um, I suppose that that the day would be relatively similar to to Craig's. Um, I I receive spirit samples from uh, from distilleries and cask samples that that we have lying in our warehouse, um, and I draw them and I see how they're getting on, and then uh, the work in the lab here is putting together small scale um, blends just uh, in a in a uh, in a glass or in a or in a small vial um, mm -hmm. and seeing how uh, you know very very small parcels so where Craig might put together a whiskey with uh, 30 40 50 whiskies um, we tend to use between sort of four and uh, 10 whiskies for a for a blend um, the reason for that is that uh, you know we're, we're we're very small so we uh, so we um, all of our whiskies are uh, limited releases and uh, unique in the in themselves. Um, we only uh, release whiskies that you know are the, the most that we've made is about five thousand bottles at a time. Um, but we've also made whiskies that are thirty bottles. Uh, wow. So it's, okay. So very very small batch. Yeah. Yeah. Very, so when very you say small. When some people say small batch, you know, there's that's a very <laughs> elastic term. Yeah, it was um, it was a, it was a, it was our first, it was in our first collection. So we released collections, um, and uh, and the first collection had uh, had number four, which was a, a very old grain whiskey paired with a also another very old grain whiskey and a little bit of a of a smoky whiskey just to bridge bridge a gap between them both. Um, but we only had sort of five liters of the. Of the exceptionally old whiskey, so uh, oh. so we were limited to the amount that we could release, um, but that was the exception, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, the, the 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 day is really just putting together uh, compositions that we think could be interesting, or 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 working on each one. I think that you know I tried to work this out last night. And I think that each blend takes between sort of a hundred and two two fifty hours of sort of trying to work, not constantly on it, but it's you know. It's a it's a few weeks. It's a good sort of month on 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 each blend trying to trying to make it just just. There, so. There's something in that that I think is very interesting because obviously with what Craig does at the scale that he's doing it, he's working with a lot of known quantities, and he's got a huge degree of control about his inputs and his his essentially his blending ingredients. And what you what you're doing is very much a boutique 
uh, kind of style operation where you're um, using ingredients that you just think are interesting. Do you ever find that by combining two ingredients with very clear profiles and you think, okay, A and B are going to go together and they're going to go together. Well, is there, does the combination sometimes produce an unexpected pleasant outcome in terms of does it create a different set of, or present a different set of estrogens that you might not have necessarily expected? In short, yes, all the, all the time. Um, we find that, uh, that, that it's not a, uh, I think Greg mentioned a link with earlier on, which has a very sort of clear green apple sort of flavor. Yeah. And if you want to sort of build a green apple flavor into a whiskey, you think, oh, link would be a great whiskey to do that. And it, and it certainly can be, but you need to, you need to augment it by adding, you know, it, it works very well with a bit of grain to be able to, which sort of highlights those, those, top esters coming through um and even a little bit of smoke again as craig said sorry to piggyback off your off your comments um but a little bit of smoke can just can just highlight those those flavors almost like adding uh you know if you add salt to a to a tomato then it makes it much more more tomato yeah uh, it's a i guess that's a that's a i don't know if that's a good analogy but it's an analogy nonetheless yeah, um, I think I, th I think you see this sometimes in um, when people do blending exercises. Shivas Regal did a really interesting activation for a, a couple of years where people were given all their constituent five or six of their constituent blend whiskies to make their own blends. And I think you can do something similar at the Johnny Walker experience in Princess Street now. And I think sometimes people just end up putting too much malt and too much peated malt in straight away, almost like a reflex. And I, I think, from my limited understanding, you have to be quite judicious on that front. Yeah, peat is the, uh, is a very tricky flavor profile to to, to work with. Um, what what we tend to find is that is that making a, a a balanced peated whiskey is one of the tougher challenges in 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 blending. It's it's finding a finding a great single malt, a peated single malt from uh, say you know Kulila is a great blending malt for, 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 for peated whiskey. And it's a beautiful single malt in itself, but using it as a component, uh, you, you almost have to be quite sparing in its, uh, in its, in its use because it can, it can take over a lot of the nuances and other flavors that you're perhaps trying to build into the blend uh, quite easily. So it's, um, it's certainly a challenge, but, um, but you know, I think when you do find a great peated or even lightly peated uh, uh, blended whiskey. You know, uh, I think about Johnny Walker Black Label or Double Black uh, in that in that frame, or um, or Black Bottle. I think is a fantastic uh, from Distel. Uh, these types of whiskies are, are, you know, are a are a real triumph in terms of the 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 art of blending. Yeah, it's it's quite a difficult balance. So I was teaching a level three spirits class on Monday, a recovering whiskey, and we like to show two different ends of the scale with you know quality when we're showing a blended scotch and one of them was a supermarket old label and the the piece was nasty it's probably the best way i could describe it in terms of balancing all the other elements and then the one that we showed as something at the opposite end of the scale in terms of the kind of macro available was that johnny walker 12 year old which always for us shows like up at the higher end. It, it, I know everyone will say that Johnny Walker 12 year old is exactly the same every year and maybe Craig can speak to this. There's always tiny differences in the way it shows. I think just really, really tiny differences. But yeah, the one that we tried on one day was showing absolutely exceptionally well. So uh, yeah, um, we're going to open up the conversation now in a little second, but I just wanted to throw back to Duncan very quickly before we do that. Duncan, um, could you talk to us a little bit about perception of scotch as a category and I really find your labeling and your bottling and how you present the information on your bottle of woven really interesting in that regard yeah I mean obviously I think the the sentiment on the call has been that blended scotch is in rude health but I think because maybe we'd existed at the very sort of premium end of the drinks industry through our whole careers we felt it had um, potentially a bit of an image problem uh, because 
if you look at other spirits categories or wine, for example, blending is seen as this incredible art form. And it is, you know, when you're in the presence of someone uh, like Craig, you know, it's 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 incredible the the care and the technique and and you know it's alchemy um uh but i think we felt there's a, a bit of uh a sort of a lot of the conversation about blending is, is done in a sort of backhanded compliment sort of way where it's you know oh great brands but you know and and i think we we really felt that um there was a bit of an Achilles heel. Everyone wants to start a distillery and we wanted to be blenders. And people said, well, why, why would you want to do that? Um, and we said, because blending is amazing. And I think that you look at the innovation that's happening at a distillery level uh, in Scotland, you know, more distilleries opened in the last 15 years than I think at any point um, in, in, in the history of Scotch. And, and that means more flavours and more different techniques and, and not many of these distilleries are setting out to make a consistent style of spirit because quite frankly that that trick's already taken by the five mm -hmm. major drinks companies that make up 75 percent of the industry so there's there's a lot of room for new flavors being developed in scotland um, by these passionate uh new wave distillers and um that's something we're really excited about because lots of the samples pete's got we're pretty sure no one's ever blended with them and no one's ever put this together with this oh, and he's okay. literally the first person to go boom and when we started doing stuff like that we felt like the the biggest challenge we're going to have as a new scotch whiskey blend is getting people to try it with an open mind mm -hmm. and so our creative brief to our design agency and i know this is wsct so i shouldn't really be talking too much about design but it is included in the, in the courses mm -hmm. um it was almost to to take lots of the information that people like your your cohort would analyze off the bottle so we don't tell you you know region we don't tell you age we have to tell you it's blended scotch whiskey but it's a big invitation to just try it and you know everyone that's involved in wsct will know the 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 magic of blind tasting you know it mm -hmm. forces you to experience it and we felt that actually if we could get more people to experience blended whiskey without prejudging it because of what it says it is um then you know the the outcomes would be a lot better and that was a trick i'll be really honest I, that we saw from uh, the great whiskey writer dave broom when he was at a single malt whiskey tasting and he had you know a mystery bottle at the end and this room full of the the geekiest single malt uh, admirers on the entire planet were just blown away by this incredible single malt and he whipped the cloth off it at the end and it was a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label and I think that that as a magic trick really stuck with me and I was like you know that's that's the secret to blending or to getting blending sort of reappraised by people is yeah. letting them taste it without knowing it's a blend and obviously we, we're very transparent we try and be transparent and I think a lot of that has come out of the history of scotch whiskey it's ridden this wave and um the way that blends shot to notoriety and then we're almost a potentially a victim of of you know the 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 trappings of success where it's about scale and consistency and efficiency and and you know it's good to see that spirit quality has never been higher than it has before but for some reason I think the perception of blending has not been looked after in the way that the perception of single malt has I think since since the 60s and, and single malt's been on this escalator of of uh of kudos and blending you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with it when when done well um, I suppose, I suppose that, yeah, ultimately they're all they are all blends it's just there yeah different names really yes um so we, we, we're about 15 minutes left so what I'd like to do is I'm going to throw open some questions to the panel um maybe keeping it in the order that we had had first and then we're going to go to some Q&A so Craig um what's your favorite whiskey and how do you like to drink it or do you like cocktails or mixing it in any way it's a really tough question because there's so many um but um my favourite, I would say, is uh, Buchanan's 18-year-old. Um, so it's a really rich and powerful 
um, mature whisky, with lots of sherry cask influence in there and lots of smoke. So that kind of suits my palate. So yeah, that's that's probably my favourite. And in terms of serve, I tend to put one block of ice in my whisky and then just let it melt. Um, that's that's my sort of preference. So so yeah, that's 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 my favourite. Nice. It sounds tempting. I haven't had the pleasure, so I'm going to have to rustle some up, I'm sure, somewhere. I might, I might talk to somebody who knows how to source some later. Um, I, Christiana, so your favourite blended scotch and your favourite scotch cocktail? I've decided I'm going to have two because it's too mean to narrow down to one. I loved the Johnny Walker celebration blend from the 200 years. I was actually reminiscing with a friend today. I was like, what was it? It was like so like well balanced and beautiful. But I also love, I think it's an island blend from Black Bottle, which is really smoky, really robust. And I love both of those. And my new thing for drinking whiskey when I'm out and about, well, it's not new at all. It's been happening for centuries. Um, a highball, but with ginger ale. So if you're in a bar or a pub and you just fancy like an easy sipping drink, just get a single measure of whatever blend you most fancy, loads of ice and get them to top it up with ginger ale and it's perfection. Yeah, yeah. Classic, classic for a reason. Um, Pete and Duncan. Should we start with um, you? Uh, okay, yeah. I Well, I the one that springs to mind for me is that uh, I, was, I was doing some research on the Leith leaf blends and uh and sort of the the history of them and i and i got an old bottle of bailey nickel jarvey which um oh. which kind of it, it, it was yeah. discontinued i think about 10 years ago or five years i don't know how long ago actually yeah. um but it was sort of the the I, I guess my dad would call it sort of cooking whiskey you know it was just uh it was always in the house and, and it was our but, speed red whiskey in, in, a, in a bar i worked in like 20 years ago it yeah great. yeah and it's and it's awesome I mean, it's beautiful, like stunning, elegant, rich. It's light in color. Yeah, absolutely. Much, much missed, much missed. I think it, uh, it had a little bit of prominence at the time that compass box were kind of coming to prominence as well. And then it just kind of faded away for some reason, which is a real shame. Yeah, but um, uh, all, all of the woven range as well. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> Correct answer. How about you, how about you Duncan? Um, uh, I'm not just saying this, but I've, I think for me, uh, a great whiskey, it's it's sort of half what's in the bottle, but it's half what you add to it through your experience and usage of it. And for that reason, I think um, I've had a lifelong relationship with Johnny Walker Black Label. Um, and I just, I, I know, and I think actually it is, um, it is a blend that does not suffer from any of the reputational um, sort of anchor that I mentioned before, you know, whether you're a single malt fan or a bartender in a, you know, top 50 uh, bar, I think it's got universal uh, respect, not just for what it's achieved, but for, for what it is. And I think um, obviously the work that, that Craig and Emma and the team do there is, is thing. So I know it's a bit, it's a bit sort of happy ending to, to, big up big big up the other one but it's you know it's the it's one of the world's greatest whiskies and and it's uh i think a fine example of what um blending can be but i was uh messaging pete uh keyboard worrying that he'd stolen bailey nickel jarvey for me from me because <laughs> that that as a leaf blend um yeah. it's something that uh you know it's almost a travesty that it was uh discontinued but it, it's it was a sign of the times and a sign of yeah. whiskey companies making long-term decisions that they were going to focus on the high margin lower volume luxury end of the market because blending they didn't believe had the potential to, to perform in that space and I think um I hope that they'll live to regret that decision uh through the work that that everyone everyone in the blending space is doing and, and 2023 feels like the year for blends there's stuff happening there is there is it's, it's really good to see um we're going to throw open to some questions um really quickly from uh because we've got about 10 minutes left uh for what it's worth my favorite scotch blend is grants 25 if i could ever get my hands on it again i would but it's uh quite uh quite pricey um and smoky cokey is my go-to high bomb mm. and uh if you like lagavulin and coca-cola or if you, if you don't think you like lagavulin and coca-cola I recommend you try it. Got a question from uh, Lee Connor, otherwise known as Connors, which a lot, who a lot of people know already. 
calling out in from Newcastle. Following recent trends in Scotland, have any of you had an experience in using spirit derived from a rye forward mash bill using a pot distillation for blending? So a rye pot still whiskey. Any insights or any experiences there? Yeah, I can I can go there if you want. Um, so yeah, we just released a product uh, entirely in North America right now called the High Rye, Johnny Walker High Rye. Um, so yeah, I was I was quite heavily involved in the in the production of the actual new make for that that product. So it's a combination of uh, rye distillates from both Cam and Bridge and Tina Nick Distillery. So um, the Cam and Bridge is a is a uh, unmalted uh, rye through the column stills, and then we used malted rye up at uh, uh, Tina combined with uh, regular uh, malted barley as well. So um, yeah, overall mash bill is is is, is quite high in rye. It's about sixty percent uh, overall mash bill rye. So yeah, that's our, our experience of of rye recently. So yeah, definitely giving us a new or a different uh, flavour style. That sort of spicy, oily. Um, rye flavour is definitely coming through, which is which is good to see. Fantastic. I've um, got a couple of technical questions coming in, which I can answer very quickly. Um, is it is it necessary that single malt or single grain must be from a single distillery, Sandeep? Uh, yes, it, it says the word single. It's the same as a single estate wine. It must come from a single distillery. So that's what that word single denotes. It can be any number of casks from that distillery. Uh, as, and for a single malt, they'll be malted barley distilled in pot stills for single grain that typically be distilled in a column still. Although there are exceptions, uh, Loch Lomond like to mess around with convention there and do some interesting stuff around that. And another one, if it says unchill filtered, chill filtration is a, basically a means of removing some uh, fatty acids and lipids from the liquid that might start to haze when the liquid gets cold. So what they do is they do that at the bottling stage just to remove that. Some people think that it removes a bit too much flavor and they don't really like it. And some people think it removes a bit of texture. That's always a, a live debate debate in the world of uh, in the world of whiskey. Um, we have got an interesting couple of interesting questions actually, and they come from they're both asking the same thing. Um, one question says, what do you do with casks that just don't fit into the blends or your quality control specifications? And the other question says, do special release labels from distilleries or distillery release suggest that they've just made a mix of casks that they were unable to use in their signature blends? Maybe that's a cynical question. I don't know if anybody's going to put their hand up for that. Well, uh, I'm stab at it before I just think I love anything that's a bit quirky and different but yeah. legally special release means like literally nothing so while I would take it as something to maybe like look at if you're looking for something perhaps a bit quirky or a bit different doesn't really mean anything so approach with caution but still be intrigued yeah I have to say one of my favorite whiskies ever was from uh Jameson Visitor Centre in Dublin, and it was a 12 year old special distillery release and it had quite a, a notable cordite aspect to it which would suggest a bit of sulfur i don't think sulfur is always attained personally sulfur in the right concentrations and the right type of sulfur can <laughs> provide a really satisfactory textural and, and flavor element especially if you're looking kind of mixing them with kind of those fusel oily type of heavy bodied whiskies so i think they can be massively successful uh, and sometimes they are Releases that just don't meet the distillery style or, or the blend style. Um, I, don't, I don't see anybody shaking their head, but I'm not going to put any, anybody on the spot to confirm or deny that. Um, so um, we've got a question here that might be for you, Craig. Um, if you've got a blend with, let's say, around 20 whiskies in there, how confident are you that each of those whiskies is bringing something to the party in terms of flavor and character? Or do some of them do different things? This relates to a question I had about what's a, a top dressing whiskey and what's a, the, the role of grain yeah. within the blend? Yeah, I mean, what we tend to do is we have what we call categories of flavor and distilleries fit into certain categories. So you might find that um, uh, something like a, um, let me think, a Glendullen might fit into a, uh, what we call the grassy cat cat category, and then uh, other ones in that category might be things like Glenord or Tinnerick. So what we find is we we blend in these categories. So everything's everything. So if it's twenty distilleries, they're all adding to that flavour component for that category. And when we pull together the overall blend recipe, 
we have to make sure we get the right percentage of that actual blend category in the overall recipe. So, so yeah, they're all contributing to that overall flavour style. But yeah, you're, there is potential to sort of substitute uh, one in for the other one, if you like, and things like that. Fantastic. I think we've got uh, time for another small questions. Uh, one question is, is there any blend on Isla? I, are there any blends that are predominantly, I mean, Johnny Walker obviously has Kalila as its kind of very signature uh, peaking up, but it's quite well integrated. Do we know if there are any blends that are just Kalila? There's no grain distillery on the island, is there? No, I, th I think it's mainly, obviously, you, get, yeah. you might get some blended malts, but uh, yeah. I would say that, that you get some blends like Double Black that I think Duncan maybe mentioned earlier, or somebody did, and uh, that's predominantly, you know, quite a smoky blend, which would have a lot of Kalila in there, for example, yeah. yeah. But not, not, I don't know of any actual blended scotches. That are, I don't think it's possible, actually, <laughs> from uh, uh, yeah. my because there's no grain distillery. Yeah, well, they could have blended malts, like you say, yeah. There's um, Isla Mist, which is a brand um, that I believe is blended, um, and they obviously use the name Isla, which... I think if if you have to tread a little bit carefully because where, where you get to this sort of level of detail, the, the rules are hazy. Uh to, to um and uh there's obviously um black bottle, which talks about its its links to Isla, obviously, but being owned or in the same family of, of brands as Buna Haben and, and pulling from that. So there are blends um, that, that refer to Isla. And I think uh, Johnny Walker actually did a regional series where they almost did a tour of the five regions of Scotland that they recognize um, with a blend over indexing uh, in terms of its, its provenance. Um, but obviously no one publishes the recipes. So there must be a reason for them claiming the name Isla uh, and, and Black Bottle talking about it. But in terms of there's no rule and there's, there's no sort of 51%, which I know is quite handy and easy to remember in, in lots of the WCT courses, but there's no, there's no, um, uh, yeah, because probably because the recipes might evolve and change and flex yeah. and, and, and things, but also. I think blenders uh, really reserve the right to have that, don't they? Unless you're, compass box and you're saying this is not a luxury whiskey and you're giving away a lot of information on the bottle <laughs> yeah i think we, we try and make sure that if we're trying to claim something that at least the flavor re reflects that so the mm -hmm. flavor is really important to us that if we're trying to claim isla we want to reflect that style in the blend it's still a blend but it reflects yeah. that style if you like yeah yeah somebody's just pointed out in the comments i think it was connor's again pointed out that the elixir distillery that's opening on isla is going to have a uh, column still as part of it so that might make that possibility a bit more of a live runner we've got a couple of questions asking what scotches are in various different blends but i don't think anybody's going to give you those full answers especially some of the blends that are being requested in the q a are not belonging to the people here there's questions of what blend what scotch is going to tv and various different things i'm not sure if anybody's in a position to answer that um but we're at 4.57 now, which I think is probably a really good time to call it, call it a, a, a day for this. I just want to make sure that we're um, um, going to cover all of, uh, is it mandatory that single malt has to be distilled in pot stills? Yes, it is. Uh, that's the last question we've had time uh, to answer today. Um, but thank you, everybody, very much for joining us. If you haven't had a chance to watch all of the seminar, it's going to be available on the WSET YouTube channel. And uh, if you are interested in doing a WSET course, please do check out WSETglobal.com. Thank you very much to Craig, to Christiana, to Pete, and to Duncan for joining us. Um, I am going to raise a glass of something. Uh, we're brand neutral at WSET, so that forbids me from saying what it is. I'm putting everybody in the spot here. I've just had this sitting. I've been waiting patiently for it. So it, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, especially to our panelists, for providing such amazing in-depth and behind-the-scenes information, which a lot of people don't really get access to in the normal course of uh, things. And uh, Sláinte. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Charlie, Bye. for organizing this thing. Thank you. Yes, folks. Have a good evening. Yeah, awesome. Bye. Nice to see all the reactions coming in from everywhere in the world. Thank you, everybody.